Good afternoon, everybody. This is Eleanor Dean with the Texas Wildlife Association. Thank you for joining us for today's Wildlife for Lunch. Today's topic is waterfall, ha waterfall habitat management, and it is presented by Kevin Harkey. He is the waterfowl and wetlands habitat specialist for Texas Parks and Wildlife. Today's Wildlife for Lunch is made possible through funding provided by the San Antonio Livestock Exposition, Inc. and is hosted by the Texas Wildlife Association and the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. And with that, I'm going to switch over to your pre presentation, Kevin, and pass the ball over to you. So there you go. Thank you, Eleanor, and um, I welcome everyone to this webinar. Um, I will be focusing on, on as, as, the, as the previous slide said, I'll be and this one, this title slide says, I'll be focusing on managing waterfowl habitat um, for those for, for in Texas. Um, okay, here's the next slide. Um, and so, I, what I hope to do in this webinar is to provide you with some information uh, pertaining to habitat. Um, what is it? Uh, what is it composed of? And how is it important to, to waterfowl, ducks, and geese? Um, and also, why manage habitats? Uh, there's been a lot of loss of wetlands in the past, and there is a need, as, as we, as we uh, the state of Texas still provides, we still have wetland habitats available. And we, uh, those having interest in waterfowl, you know, should realize that management is important to maintain uh, these, the, the quality of these wetlands for, for waterfowl to, to use. And then finally, um, provide some information to, to you as uh, I'm a private landowners and others uh, interested in, in managing wetlands. Uh, techniques for, for management, um, how, how to manage, and, and I'll have even some final slides that discuss um, unique, unique situations uh, for, for or specifics, uh, uh, managing specific wet, wetland types. And so with that, um, let's jump on into this. Um, so what is habitat? Well, habitat is, is briefly stated, it's just the natural environment in which an organism lives. Um, very simple. Simply put, it's neighborhood. Uh, it's where they 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 live their life uh, and and meet the daily requirements. So of, of their of um, for their of their life, and so you know that includes where they rest, where they sleep, um, where they find their food, where they find a mate, and also raise young. And so habitat is, is composed of, uh, of four components, um, and this is not just specific to waterfowl, but for for um, for all for all animals, these basic components are, are necessary. Uh, and so, starting with food, um, for for waterfowl, this can be either plant or animal. Um, both, uh, you know, ducks and geese are adapted to, to using different types of plant of either you know plant materials being seed or her uh, actual uh, uh, vegetative uh, parts, or they can even feed on um, invertebrates, uh, wetland invertebrates being you know, like little bugs and, and other critters like snails and even small fish or uh, tadpoles in some, in some cases. Um, water is important. Um, this is, you know, what, the name waterfowl, you know, water is part of the word waterfowl and, and, and water is important. They, they use it for drinking. Um, many many ducks need water to feed in, and they use it for for loafing, for resting. And then finally, you know, in Texas, it require water to raise young. Uh, cover is important. Uh, it provides protection from the from, from extreme weather, and also as a, a way to escape predators. And then finally, a space. Is, is is important for in terms of for the uh, habitat. You know, you have to think about the amount, the type of habitat, their amounts, and their arrangement on the landscape um, are all important uh, in in having a uh, in terms of a landscape being suitable for waterfowl to use. 
So starting with, with food, I just wanted to be a little more specific and, and talk about um, that, uh, mention that, you know, that species, that there are multiple species of ducks and geese, um, and I'm going to be tying, I'm, for this, for these next couple of slides, I'll be talking mainly about ducks, but, you know, they're, they're adapted to, to different, to foraging on different food types. Um, so, for example, uh, large-bodied dabbling ducks such as mallards and pintails um, feed on, on, on seeds and on uh, animal, um, animal, prey animals such as you know, little aquatic bugs and snails. Um, during winter time, they're exclusively, almost exclusively feeding on seeds, um, and then as, as winter progresses and, and turns into spring, they, their, their diet starts to change, and, they, and they, their requirements, um, are, they have requirements for feeding on, on protein, uh, or, I'm sorry, food items high in protein, such as uh, animal, animal foods, uh, and, that's, and that's important for their, uh, for their breeding. Smaller uh, bodied uh, ducks such as teal are also considered dabblers in that they, you know, they feed on seeds and, and they also feed on, and, 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 and again, they, they too, as winter progresses in the spring, they, they switch their diets towards, towards a more of a high protein uh, animal food diet. Um, for, for diving ducks, they are capable of feeding on uh, more plant matter. Um, Less, less seeds and more, uh, more uh, vegetative uh, parts, such as tubers, um, rhizomes, little nutlets that are, beyond, that are below the surface of water, and they also feed on, on aquatic invertebrates, little, little worms, which, such as what I have pictured here and some other uh, aquatic larvae. And then finally, um, we have two ducks. There are some ducks that just feed exclusive, exclusively on aqu aquatic uh, plants. Uh, here we have uh, pictured a gadwall and widgeon, and they're both adapted to feeding on uh, plants, strict, strictly plants for, for the most part during, during the, the winter. So concerning water, um, you, need to realize, you need to realize that each of the, those species that I mentioned in the previous slides um, have, are adapted to feeding in different, at different water depths. And so for the most part, um, waterfowl are feeding at, are, are using habitats that have uh, water levels at anywhere from 6 to 12 inches and, and maybe a, a, up to 18 inches. Also, water conditions are important. Um, uh, clarity of water can be is it can be important uh, a factor in producing um, submerged aquatics. If you have murky water during the growing season, uh, these submerged aquatics cannot grow. They can't as they cannot uh, as light will not be able to penetrate the water to uh, help the plant grow. Um, also, here on the coast, um, which is where I'm close, which I'm where I'm located, uh, water the salinity of the water is important. Um, high salinity water is usually not considered a, a good um, wetland site for, for waterfowl to feed in as, as certain food plants are not available because of the salinity content. And so as I mentioned earlier concerning cover, um, it's, it's important for providing, uh, providing protection from the elements and also uh, a way to escape predators. However, too much cover, such as uh, the, the, the pictures uh, on, the, on the bottom right, uh, can be a problem. With, with too much cover, there, there's just no way they can actually land in, in the wetland and also mobility on the water will be very, will be very tough. And this, here, this slide here depicts an example of, of what I meant by space. All these different, the, the greens, the different shades of green and the blues and the oranges all represent some type of habitat, uh, different types of habitat in this small, uh, in this small area that depicted by the circle, the, 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 which is a thin line. This is like a 12 square mile area and um, 
I'm sorry, this is an area that's buffered with, with a, by 12 miles, and all these habitats are contained within this area. And such a situation leads to a congregation of waterfowl of, of, of many species. So why do we manage habitat? Well, first off, you have to realize that we've lost a lot in, over time. And then second, um, in Texas, the state is an important area for, for waterfowl. Many species migrate here. Um, and then finally, uh, we manage habitat to try and maintain a, a quality at a high level on, on uh, uh, limited sites. So in terms of loss, uh, I'm sure you've all seen slides like this in the past in other presentations. Uh, since the since you know settlement, we've all every state in, in the lower 48 has lost. And Texas, while it hasn't been as extreme as, as some, has at least has lost at least half the wetlands they since uh, the 1780s. So this translates into a, a starting at somewhere around 16 million wetlands, 16 million acres of wetlands to approximately seven seven and a half to 7.6 million acres of wetlands. And this habitat loss comes from such activities as drainage and filling from the conversion of, you know, for, for uh, conversion of, for agriculture, urban development, and transportation projects. Also, um, flooding and restricting of, of uh, flows downstream from, from reservoirs have an impact on habitat. Uh, you're flooding, the, the, the reservoirs end up flooding sites that are adjacent to natural wetlands adjacent to rivers and streams, and then second, the, um, the holding back of water causes uh, wetlands downstream along that river to, to be dry during most of the, the growing season. And then finally, here on the coast, there's the issue of erosion and subsidence um, from dredging projects and the fossil fuel extraction, your oil and gas extraction, has resulted in, uh, in, in, in a loss of elevation on, on coastal wetlands, so that they're being inundated by, by salt water and then converted into more open, high saline uh, environments. And then finally, I just want to let you know that you know habitat loss continues to occur. You know, in Texas, we're the population is supposed to expand and continue expanding, and this just means that we're going to see more loss. Um, and these slides kind of this, these slides these images are from the same area, and it's a on the left is is we have here a um, an area that's that was basically un unpopulated, and then over time it's been developed and a segment and a portion of the habitat's been lost. A pretty significant portion of the habitat has been lost. So Texas is an, is, is an important area for migratory waterfowl. Um, from winter, looking at winter, uh, looking at winter counts by, done by biologists, Texas accounts for nearly 70% of all waterfowl counted in the central flyaway in winter. And this translates into uh, roughly 3.7 million ducks and 0.7 million geese migrating to Texas each winter. And so if we continue to lose habitat, there's always a chance that we may, it may result in fewer waterfowl migrating to Texas. So we manage habitat to improve their quality and, um, and improve the quality of, of fewer habitats that are available in an effort to raise the what we call the carrying capacity to to um, make habitat suitable for a larger number of ducks and geese. And so you try to take a, a piece of habitat um, like here on the left that's choked up and in, in that is choked up with vegetation that does not produce any uh, seeds and, and food for waterfowl to a site that is is more suitable for, for foraging. It, it, it has plants that are that are annual plants that produce 
are capable of producing large crops of seeds that, that ducks and geese tend to, uh, tend to feed on. So what can we do to, um, in terms to, to improve the situation and improve uh, habitats? Well, you can conserve areas of conserve wetland areas that are, that are high in diversity and quality. Um, however, just by conserving an area, you still need to think about how to make it uh, maintain uh, a high quality. You can restore a site to a uh, to to a to a to be more beneficial to waterfowl. And you can also create new habitats in, in sites where uh, wetlands did not exist pre previously. And then finally, you can manage um, created wetlands and existing wetland habitats intensively to, to maintain a high quality and to bump up that carrying capacity to support more, more numbers of ducks and geese. So, what are the components of good wintering habit of good wintering waterfowl habitat? Well, it's a as I've probably mentioned before, it's abundant food, and that could be either that could come from seeds that are produced by abundant by an annual plants such as smartweeds and, and millets. Um, it can also mean invertebrates such as aquatic bugs, snails, and then finally for those. Um, you know, it's also important for species of ducks that are adapted to eating vegetation. You try to, you can also provide a site that uh, that, is, that is is abundant with submerged aquatic vegetation, such as coontails and, and pond weed, or even, and even duck uh, duckweed. It also means that uh, good watering, the good habitat, does not has a has a lack or or is completely devoid of undesirable plants. Um, perennial plants such as cattails, willow, and, uh, and non-native species such as tallow trees, uh, if allowed to go uh, undisturbed, they'll completely choke up the wetland and make it unsuitable for, for waterfowl. And also you have to have a site that, is, that provides fishing depth. Uh, most ducks are, are adapted to feeding at water, in water depths of 6 to 12 inches. And so you want to try to provide this, this foraging depth um, across the majority of the wetland uh, to be for, to be have optimal conditions. I wanted to from now from here on out I want to try and provide some management techniques that can be used to convert a site of low productivity and, and low food and low food availability into one of high productivity with high foods or I'm sorry high availability of foods. First, though, I want to talk about plant succession, as it's important to know, um, have an understanding of how plant succession ties in with managing habitats and providing habitats that are uh, high quality for waterfowl. Um, over time, without any kind of disturbance, uh, habitat can 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 be converted, can be can change in, in the vegetative community. Uh, you can start with annual plants that are adapted to that are adapted to disturbance, um, and as disturbance declines and the habitat becomes and the conditions become more constant, the site is changed by cha by being converted into uh, a community that's composed of perennial pl pl plants and grasses that produce fewer seeds, and then eventually it will turn into a more shrubby habitat, and ultimately. It can, without any kind of dis disturbance, uh, tree it can become more of a forested uh, type habitat. And so, for wintering waterfowl in Texas, uh, the, what you want to try and achieve in, for, in habitat management is you want to keep the habitat in the stages that are here on the left side of the, dot, of the red dotted line. You want to maintain a site that, that's that's product that has productive where annual pr plants grow and produce seeds. Uh, this is what's considered quality foraging habitat for waterfowl, and this is the considered the early succession stage of a habitat. So this early successional stage can be maintained with disturbance. Um, activities such as shredding, disking, grazing, fire, and water level management are all considered ways to uh, put land, uh, disturbance to, as, I'm sorry, ways to manipulate a habitat and disturb it to maintain 
a productive site for annual plants. So I wanted to go over each of them and provide some uh, pros and cons of each uh, of each management technique. So for shredding, you have to realize that it's just simply you're simply mowing the vegetation, and so it doesn't really necessarily change the plant community, but it can set back woody growth. Um, it also can set, uh, open up holes in dense areas prior to flooding, and then sometimes, and in some situations, you may be able to still shred when the site's not completely dry. Disking obviously requires a completely dry uh, situation. It, it, it's more successful in setting back succession, um, but this, this also depends on the depth of your, of your equipment that you're, that you're pulling to the soil. Um, it helps create a seed bed for, for planting seeds and, can, and also stirs up the seed bank to expose um, seeds that have been in the soil for a period of time and, and, and helps them to germinate. In situations where organic matter had accumulated because water levels were maintained at a constant at constant levels over the growing season, disking can break up that organic matter and help it help return the nutrients into the soil. Um, it, it too also, uh, disking also sets back woody growth and is capable of killing species if you're able to uh, uproot the, the plants. And disking as well opens up holes in dense areas. Prescribed burning. Um, this this also sets back a succession. It's helpful in, in 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 setting back woody growth, and may even kill some species of of shrubs. However, it can be somewhat patchy in it, in its a uh, in how it uh, is applied to the to the habitat. You know, some you know, wetlands can be sometimes too wet, and the vegetation may be too moist for for it to catch fire. And then second, you have to always worry about you know the, the the fuel loads and the weather conditions, primarily humidity and moisture on the on the ground for for uh, to have an effective burn. Grazing cattle grazing can be used um, as well in managing wetlands. However, you must however you must manage it or monitor it closely. Um, Cattle like to eat a lot of the plants that, that produce seeds that, that waterfowl eat. And so if you have cattle for too long, if you have cattle on a wetland for too long during the growing season, you may, or quite likely, never gonna, you're not going to produce any uh, food for, for ducks and, and geese. And also, it's some, cattle can be patchy in how they disturb the landscape. Also, you can. Uh, Disturb sites from with managing water levels. Seasonal drawdowns, either managed or natural through evapor just natural evaporation, encourage growth of, of favored encourage the growth of those favored early succession plants that produce abundant seeds. It's ideal for sites with that are with um, water control structures that are capable of slow of slow drawdowns. Um, and I'm talking about structures such that, that are equipped with a, a riser and, and boards where you can uh, manipulate the water level by inches uh, every so often during uh, during the growing season so as so prolong so this so managing water levels helps avoid having prolonged helps uh, Counteract prolonged flooding, which can lead to less productive habitat and encroachment by by undesired invasive perennials such as cattails and bulrush. Also, you must think that must realize that um, drought can be an effect can be an a, be a beneficial for natural wetlands where where managed drawdown is not possible. It also provides that stimulation for the for the growth of early successional plants. Herbicide is somewhat more of a selective way to um, to tar to uh, to uh, to uh, reduce growth of undesirable plants, and also 
control the growth of non of non native plants as well. Um, you can target you can target specific plant types, be selective in, in how you in the areas of, of treatment. However, you must know your plant communities. You must understand what kind of species are out there because some herbicides are more effective on on one herbicide may be more effective on a, a certain on a, a one species versus other herbicides. Um, and also in wet, in situations where there's water on the on where there is water, you must use a herbicide that's approved for aquatic sites. And, and usually, the, and usually the label tells you this. And so now I like to talk about um, management of specific wetland sites that can may be encountered on on private lands. One of the most typical uh, situations in Texas is, is for, for managing wetlands are, are moist, is moist soil wetland management. Here, this, this type of management uses water level management to mimic the natural process of seasonal flooding and drying to stimulate the production of seed producing plants to, and to maintain that early successional stage in the plant, in the plant uh, community. It's typically um, done on a designed wetland. Um, what I mean by that is a site that is either a uh, wetland that's either been enhanced or even created through the use of levees and water control structures and even um, a, a water source that's dependable such as a, a well or maybe some other kind of irrigation source. It does, this type of management requires disking every two to three years, again to bring that disturbance and, and break up uh, Break up the soil and limit the growth of, of perennial plants. As I stated earlier, it, it, it's, it's using a, it uses drawdowns and to, and to encourage plants to grow. However, there's a by timing the drawdown at different periods of the growing season, you can influence the growth. You can, excuse me, um, you can promote different plants. And this is the table that sort of helps explain this. Um, so starting with a drawdown during the first 45 days after the last frost, you have there's a pot there's a diff, you have a plant response that results in the growth of smart weeds or chufa flat sedge, um, spike rush, and millets. These are plants that do well in soil temperatures that are cool to moderate, um, and the high rainfall during this period of the year helps provide helps these plants grow. <clears throat> A mid-season drawdown is also also produces millets and other uh, beneficial waterfowl foods, but it also leads to um, leads to the growth of less productive species such as uh, coffee bean and cocklebur. These are usually species you don't want to see in these impoundments. So you might have to do some kind of management. If you're, if you're forced to do a mid-season drawdown, you might have to do some management to, to reduce these, to reduce coffee bean and cocklebur. Um, you can also wait and do a later to to do a uh, drawdown later in the season, some t and during the last 90 day, during the last 90 days before the the first frost, here that we have warm soil temperatures, um, but you have moderate to low rainfall and high evaporation rates. Now some plants are are adapted to this, and they can and they do produce abundant seeds such as sprinkle top and crabgrass, um, but sometimes conditions may not be conducive for their germination. And then finally, an alternative to drawdowns, you can actually keep shallow water on for the entire growing season, and this will result in growth of emergent wetland plants that have, uh, that produce uh, food items such as uh, tubers and, and succulent rhizomes that are that are eaten by mallards and by geese. So you have plant, plants like delta duck potato and spike rushes and 
and also sometimes burr head. Here's another example of, of t common wetland types in, in that on, pri on private lands, uh, stock ponds. Um, when stock ponds are the most ideal for ducks when, when grazing is absent. And that's because grazing tends to lead to a murky, murky water, uh, a lack of plant growth, just because you know those those cows have access to the site. So if if you have a site that's where you're where you're not grazing, then perhaps and you have a stock pond on it, and perhaps you might be able to be able to manage it for for ducks. Um, ponds with depths at two to three feet and they have good water clarity can be productive sites for the growth of submerged aquatic vegetation. And these are perfect sites for um, a perfect foraging habitat for ducks such as widgeons, gadwalls, and ringneck ducks. Um, also, if you're if this if this stock pond is located in, in on the coast, in the southern coast, towards uh, in the Maguna Madre area, this water if it's can be if these stock ponds can be a great source of fresh drinking water for bay feeding ducks such as redheads and pintails. These ducks are feeding in high in high saline environments. Um, in, 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 in seagrass beds, and because they feed in such a high saline environment, they need to have drinking water d throughout the day uh, to counteract the, the effects of the, of the salt water. And then for those in the, pan, in the Texas Panhandle, playa wetlands are pretty are, are could be are a common are, could be a common uh, habitat type on on private lands. These are freshwater wetlands in the southern Great Plains, and they're shallow and historically dependent on rainfall. Um, they're isolated, meaning that they don't receive water. They only receive water from rain, and they're not interconnected with any other playas, nor are they connected with a, a river or, a, any, or some other type of uh, uh, riverine system. And they also have, their, they frequently go through a wet-dry cycles. Um, they may go wet and dry multiple times in a year, depending on rainfall. All of this, all these conditions are perfect for, uh, are perfect disturbance that promotes early successional plants, such as millets and smartweeds. Now, playas do have some unique circumstances. Um, there's, they are they are very unique, and they have issues that you need to realize that you to, that you need to prevent. Um, for one, playas need should have a to maintain water quality and to maintain and to prevent sedimentation of the of the uh, basin. You need to establish a, a vegetative a vegetative buffer to to um, prevent the flow of sediments from cropped fields into that basin. Also, you should exclude cattle from a base from from the basin. Uh, if if not, you're going to end up having no food as the as the cows will eat that will eat the plants that produce seeds that ducks like to eat. And if you're inter interested in uh, restoring a playa, you can remove the accumulated sediments that have built up over time. Time from the effects of, of farming around around the wetland. Plowing should be limited, um, as as it can disturb the uh, the soil underneath and possibly even le uh, result in a um, in the loss of, of of water. And then second, you can you can use if you have a a way to to flood the site. Uh, providing winter water is important for waterfowl in this area of Texas, as in many of these sites sometimes only one or two playas in the Panhandle may be flooded, and these sites are are definitely being used by ducks because that's the only water that's around. Um, by providing water to these, by having a means to provide water to a playa during a dry winter, um, you're just providing more habitat for ducks and geese. Also, um, agricultural wetlands can be can be managed for for ducks and geese. 
The waste grain from these fields offer an excellent food source. Um, these grain fields can be managed for waterfowl after harvest. Um, for rice field, if, uh, so rice production is is definitely one of fits one of these categories. Um, rice field infrastructure facilitates water level management. The uh, the levees the levees and the water control structures are already there and in place, and sometimes even the water source is there, um, providing easy an easy way to uh, manage for for wintering waterfowl habitat. Um, you can also do manage for habitat on row crop fields where such as corn and milo that are that also is, is considered excellent that is also uh, these waste grains are also used by ducks and geese and so and you can do this in, in where there's low where there are low spots if you can um, add a add a levee to hold water or or just simply provide water to a to a site um, this is another way of, of managing an agricultural wetland um, also, you must consider the distance to roost water. These sites may or may not be used for foraging, depending on the distance to 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 roost water. Where, especially in the case of geese, geese um, tend to use agricultural sites that are tied to some kind of a roost water, where they can spend the night and also spend the day resting after feeding. Well, that's um, that's basically the end of this and of this presentation, and I'm willing to take any questions you may have. All right, thank you. So, if uh, if anyone has any questions, please post them in the chat window to all participants, and I will relay those questions over to you, Kevin. And so far, nobody has asked anything. We had a question early on. Someone was wondering if these are going to be available online um, afterwards. So, which they are. I posted a link, um, but they're available on our website, texashydenwildlife.org. So, if anyone wants to view this or any of our other ones, then um, you can go there. Okay, we have a question here. Is uh, is TPWD available to come look at a site and make reservations, or excuse me, make a record? Recommendations. Um, yes, we are. Um, depending on where you're located at, um, there are biologists, are likely biologists in your area, and we have we have biologists that are specifically um, available for private land recommend to provide recommendations to private landowners. And I believe, um, yes, there is a website. If you go to our home, if you type in. From our web, from our main website, you can type in um, "find a biologist," and it should take you to a site where you can click on your county. And after doing so, you'll have a table that'll pop up with um, biologists' names and and their contact information that are specific to doing work in your county. Also, if 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 you're in my area, in my region, you can see the the last slide has my phone number and email. If you want to jot that down, go right ahead. Um, and I'd be happy to help you um, either personally or perhaps if you're located somewhere else, I can find someone that would be more appropriate. Uh, yes, uh, Jefferson County. Is that where? I, I have a contact. I can, if that person would be, uh, I, don't, I don't have a phone number in front of me, but that person is uh, by the name of Mike Resitech. And I, I guess if I give me a couple minutes, I can give a phone number. Um, Yes, the phone number is 409-736-2551. Just ask and just wait for the, uh, the, 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 the there will be a menu. When you call that number, there will be a menu and, and you have to wait for his name and his extension. So if anyone else has another question, please uh, please post them in the blank here in the all participants in the chat box if you'll have any other questions for Kevin. And um, oh, somebody asked. Let's see, a whole bunch of questions just popped up. <laughs> Are there any FSA or NRCS programs available for cost sharing for financial help? 
Yes, and um, I would ask that person to contact their local FSA or NRCF representative in the county they're located at. Okay, another question. What type of plant did you expect to manage for in saline sites? I'm assuming this question um, relates to saline sites like on the coast. Um, typically managing coastal, natural coastal habitats are, are, is quite difficult um, because you don't really you don't really have access to the site if it doesn't drain if it doesn't ever you know dry out. Um, and then second, it's somewhat um, it's I mean it's just hard. It's just more difficult to do so. And unless, with one exception being maybe you can provide a, a freshwater if your site is somewhat um, uh, isolated from from say a uh, a, a, a riverine situation where a river, you know, flows into the flows into the bay or flows into the marsh, you can perhaps maybe, maybe add a add some kind of a freshwater source to to, to provide uh, additional to sort of uh, provide an in like an artificial freshwater inflow into that saline site. Okay. Um, one person one person has asked them. Um, Thoughts on predator management? What's I'm sorry. What's that? What are your thoughts on predator management? If if you're, I think predator management is is a is something that can be accomplished during the for 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 uh, your breeding waterfowl. If you have if you're trying to protect um, broods, that's something I think that's something important to try. If 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 you have the means to do so. And yes, it can be. It can be. It can be a good tool. Okay, and then I have another person um, talking about hardwood management and flooded timber. Um, he says I heard no mention of that. Um, so is that something that would work? It can be done. Um, it requires a lot of. It can require some infrastructure um, if you're trying to. Pro, uh, if you're trying to maybe uh, prolong or ha uh, maintain a flooded conditions during winter, um, that can be done. Like I said, it, but it's, it requires building um, building levees and adding water control structures. And you must also realize that the timing of the drawdown is very important for for flooded timber. So you want to do it before those leaves comes out, before the leaves pop out, um, so that you don't kill don't kill the trees. And I'm not seeing any more questions right now, so um, if you have any more questions, please continue to post them in the chat window to all participants. There, uh, there will be a survey that will pop up after the program, by the way, so um, if you could please fill that out, um, just some, some basic questions, um, we'd be happy to hear your comments on today's webinar. And uh, not seeing any questions right now. Our our next webinar will be on May 16th, and that program will cover predator control, and it will be presented by Michael Bodenchuk. So that'll be our next webinar. I'm not seeing any other questions. So um, I think we're getting ready to wrap up. Oh, here's a question. Um, so somebody says, I planted millet last summer. Can I expect to reseed this year? It depends. Um, sometimes, generally, sometimes millet in the right conditions is able, are able to volunteer the next, you know, the, seed, the, the seeds that were produced from those plants that you, that you put in the ground um, are capable of germating the following season. You just, you just have to monitor it closely and see what happens. But it's quite possible you may still have to, you may have to see it again. Okay, and then we have another question about plants. Can you transplant smartweed from one location to another? Transplanting, I guess, meaning by taking a plant and moving it into an actual you know plant that's already growing and moving into another site, you can. Um, however, I think it could be somewhat somewhat difficult, somewhat labor intensive. Um, 
I mean, you could, uh, seeding might be easier if you try to harvest the seeds from the site where you have where you have smartweed and bring it into another site. Uh, I don't know of any. I do not know of any vendors, um, commercial vendors, that provide that have a source of, of smartweed for sale. All the questions again for now. So, if you have any more, please post them. And uh, thank you so much for coming and doing this today for us, Kevin. Especially at the last minute with all the all the switch arounds, I really appreciate that. Kevin doing this. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. So. Post if you have another one. Otherwise, uh, I think we're about ready to wrap up. All right. Yeah, I think that's the last of our questions. So um, thank you so much. And as you can see, Kevin's um, information is here if you need to contact him, as well as on the website. And you should be able to view this. I'll try and have it up by. Um, early next week up on our website as well. So if you want to view this again or any of our old webinars, you can go to texas-wildlife.org and that should be where you can find it. Okay, so kind of a update on the previous question about uh, transplanting smart weed. Um, yeah, he says getting seeds from existing and taking them to another location. That's what he was asking about. All right, so um, I guess with that, I'm going to close out today's presentation, unless you have any additional comments, Kevin? No. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to participate in this webinar. Yeah, thank you I hope for I, coming and helping us out. And again, if you know, people can use my contact information on, this slide, on, the, on the last slide to um, talk to me individually if they have other questions or are seeking help with, with, um, with management. All right. Thank you very much, then. So with that, I'm going to close out the webinar. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, thank you for presenting today. Thanks. You're welcome.